Today, my guest is Josie Naughton, a woman with courage, a huge heart, and an unstoppable spirit. In 2015, Josie and a couple friends met for lunch in London where they live and decided they would try to help just some of the 1 million refugees who were arriving in Europe at the time from Syria and several other countries. Most were barely surviving without food, shelter, or water, and she and her friends decided to make a social media post asking for support to buy provisions for those suffering in the camps. Things progressed, and eight years later, Josie heads up Choose Love, an innovative and very effective NGO helping displaced individuals and families in 34 countries. From Ukraine to Syria to Afghanistan to Mexico, whether responding to a natural disaster or a refugee crisis, Josie is on the ground working with local groups to learn what is needed and to see with her own eyes which local groups are actually engaging in doing the work to help people. Then she goes to work fundraising to get exactly what they need. Josie and her organization have raised over $100 million in less than eight years. She's out to encourage the whole world to choose love as a way of life. And she's a shining example of exactly that. I believe you're going to be as inspired by Josie and Choose Love organization as I am. Now would be a great time to click the subscribe button or follow and maybe leave us a review. It would help so much. So now please enjoy this conversation between me and Josie Naughton. (laughs) Okay, so Josie Naughton, hi and welcome to the program. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I feel so lucky to be here. Well, um, I'm the lucky one. I've been following uh, Choose Love and your work, um, not since you started, but for a couple of years. And um, Refugees is kind of my thing. This shows about how we change the world, but my softest spot, my thing that I always go to is refugees. So I, I particularly have been have been following you and the work you've been doing. And I just, I love what you're doing. So I'm excited for other people in the U.S. to learn more about you, Thank um, you. And, and your work with Choose Love for sure. Um, so before we get started, what are you doing? You're, so you're in the U.S. now. You're in San Francisco, but you're normally in London. You're London based. Yeah, I always by your accent. <laughs> I always say my cat is in London, so oh. that, that that is <laughs> that's where, where home is, right? That's where yeah. home is. Yeah, but I I am on the road quite a lot, um, uh, and I'm in the U.S. a lot for fun, for fundraising. I've okay. actually just been though at the at the border. I was in San Diego and Tijuana, um, and then I've just arrived in San Francisco. Well. You know, I realized last night that I don't, I didn't think of a question about the Mexico border, but I, it's almost, I want to start talking about it pretty early on because I don't want to forget it. I'd love to know what, if there's anything you can report that, because I've talked to people who tell us things that are not in the news and you probably would do the same. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. what what always strikes me and struck me on this trip is kind of how, although it's obviously different and it's a different context, but how similar the situation is at this border or at the border in Greece. Is it? Border. Yeah, it, it is. And in principle, in the fact that governments are like reinforcing these borders, they're making the system so hard and so complex for mm-hmm. people to be able to navigate that, that we're kind of seeing a, an almost ban on asylum that's happening um, Mm -hmm. across the globe. Um, and then there's just these, you know, huge numbers of people, um, who have been through more than we can ever imagine. And uh, in Tijuana, there are just these amazing organizations, grassroots community-based organizations who are supporting people, helping them navigate the system. Um, you know, people are being put in detention, depending on the color of your skin, you're, you're treated in a, in a, in a different way by the, by the, by the government, it's it's heartbreaking to hear that. Which you know, government are you referring to? The well, Mexican government or the U.S. government? That happens everywhere, but in in this case, the, the U.S. Oh. government. You know, I was really struck by something that I heard. Um, there's this new app, the CBP One app, which is what people have to use to get their appointment, okay. Okay. and it's basically impossible to navigate. Um, but even with that app, they're only doing two hundred um, two hundred interviews a day but they have the capacity to do at least 400 a day. And when Ukrainians were arriving at the border, they were doing a thousand a day. Mm. So it shows you how possible it is, but that, that there's a choice. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. You know, 
I was going to get to this later, but this is such an important point. Um, I one of the things that I one of the reasons why I appreciate you and choose love and trust organization so much is that you always speak the truth and you don't often hear that. Well, you rarely hear it with government or anything. You hear it a little bit in the press. But when I hear you talking about what's going on in Syria, like with the U.N. or Russia bombing you know, Syrians right after the earthquake or or what you're saying now that that the color of your skin can determine how you're treated at the border, which obviously we almost know that by just because that's how life is. But um, to hear it said, I just I love that you you speak the truth about what governments are doing because that's important. Thank and, you so much. You know, it's, it actually means a lot to me that you've um, picked that up because it's something that's really important to us. And in the kind of over the years, as we've done different strategy sessions, speaking the truth is always something that's um that, that we hmm. make sure is in there and that is is really really important to us well you're a very different brand of ceo i mean in the us we don't call the head of charity ceos we typically call them directors so but in in the uk it, that's a ceo yeah of a, of a charity yeah well let's um let's back up a little bit so people know what the heck we're talking about <laughs> um why don't we start with just talking about um and some of this i know is going to be repetitive for you but probably that's what your job is right yeah <laughs> being repetitive yeah um, so can you just talk about maybe what the mission is and just what you do what choose love does of course so um, the mission of Choose Love is to work towards a world that chooses love and justice every day for everyone. Mm. Um, and we do that by um, uh, what, what, where we're focused on is forcibly displaced people. So refugees, asylum seekers, people who are internally displaced in their countries. And Even from something like an earthquake or, or a natural disaster. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and, and that's kind of really developed o over the years. Yeah. Um, but we... We basically close and or try to close and prevent gaps in services and protections for refugees and displaced people. And we do that by fundraising and then using mm -hmm. the funds that we have raised to grant give to community based frontline organizations who okay. are really doing the work. And, and what we've seen over the years is that when you go to all of these different contexts of emergencies, mm -hmm. you you expect to see big aid agencies or governments there and you tend not to. You actually see yeah. grassroots community organizations. And so they we, we just want to get the resources into their hands because they they know hmm. what is best to do. We prioritize yeah. organizations that are led by the impact of community themselves. And we fund completely cross sector and we fund lots of different organizations in an ecosystem because we, we really believe that when an mm. ecosystem of people is resourced, then that's when we see the change in the world that, that we want to see. My goodness. Okay. So first of all, uh, why are, I've heard this now a number of times from different people that I've interviewed and just, um, I've read also that often you don't see the big NGOs that everyone's giving the money to. And I remember when I was a kid, my dad said, don't give your money to those big NGOs because <laughs> they never get there. And I always thought he was a bit of a you know naysayer or something. But I've heard this way too many times now to know it's not true. Like, yeah. Where's all that money going? Because that's what most... Most people say, well, I won't name names, but they'll see the big names that they know. And they're like, well, it's safe to give to them. And then yeah. here's somebody who's at the on the scene knowing that those people aren't always showing up first or fully. So, yeah, it's, it, I mean, is it, I have go to, so far as to say it's corruption or would you go that far or do you know? I, I, I think it's, I think it's really complicated. I think that some of the INGOs do um, do amazing work and they do work that grassroots organizations and organizations like Choose Love can't do. Okay. Um, do I think that they are as efficient as they could be? No. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of it is inefficiency. I think a lot of it is bureaucracy. I think a lot of it is red tape. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of it is... Um, so in terms of speed, I mean, that's one thing when, when there's, right. when, when the invasion of Ukraine happened, when the earthquake happened, people need help in that moment. Mm -hmm. And, um, the, the, by the time that the big organizations and governments have set strategies and got it approved by everyone that it needs to get approved by, it's too, it's often too yeah. late for the, for yeah. the support that's needed. Especially that, when you're talking about life, motion. life or death situations, when they yeah. help that moment, that day, that week. 
And in the earthquake, that was, I think, the most stark example of that, because it, it mm. literally was a race against time to get people out right. from under the rubble. And um, so I, I think I think that the the bureaucracy of it and the time it takes and all the different layers things have to go through, which, of course, it is still important to make sure everything is safe. But I hope that Choose Love shows that you can still do that, but also do it fast. Yeah. I think these sometimes these are big machines. And by right. the time the big machine is paid for, the amount of funding that actually ultimately gets released yeah. is really small. Um, yeah. And, yeah. and I that's think that's one of the things yeah. I think. I think sometimes it's like people who are based in offices in the US or the UK, they've never been to the ground. They're not plugged mm -hmm. into what's happening there. Yeah. They just yeah. don't, they actually just don't know. Um, well, that's also one of the things that is so remarkable about you is that you're there on the ground. You're the, you're the head of the organization and you're there, you're in Turkey on the ground. You're getting, I don't know if you go into Syria or not, but if they let you, but I mean, you go, you, I, did, did you go to Ukraine as well? I do you know I I I really want to go. I nearly I nearly went, but it was decided that for safety um, I couldn't. But I've been yeah. to the border um, in Poland, yeah. and I because it is a live war zone. There. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah right. it is. I mean, but some of our team, um, uh, like specialist team members mm -hmm. and colleagues, yeah. have, have gone in. Um, and the same it's on the, this recent trip um, to Turkey, one of our colleagues he did go into Northwest Syria again. I was going to, wreck, but for yeah, various yeah. different reasons, I, I couldn't, but, um, but go right up, go right up to the border, but it is, it's so important. And, and I think because of, and we'll probably get there in a minute, but the origin story of the organization was, was it, what, there was no intention to set up an organization and it was going to places, seeing what was happening and then being like, oh my God, we have to, we have to do something about that. Um, and, I, and so that, it's really important to keep that ethos of, of being there and truly understanding what's what's yes, going on yes. so that we can look people in the eyes and say, I 100% know where your money's going and I 100% right. know it's going to the right place. Yes. Okay. Well, we will talk more about that and the origin story. The only thing I wanted to say first um, is I just wanted to put some numbers out there because if this is the accurate figures right now, um, it's you supported almost 4 million people worldwide. With your with your partners on the ground, you've distributed more than five million meals, three million. You call them nappies, we call them diapers, <laughs> um, and uh, six hundred fifty thousand items of clothing. You've rescued twenty thousand people at sea, which was a whole new thing I wanted to know about. I wasn't aware of that before. Um, medical two hundred thousand medical consultations. I mean, the numbers are massive. I think you've raised a hundred hundred million dollars. Yeah. Okay, so that's why that number. Is, is is mind blowing because of the origin story you're about to tell? Because you're only eight years old. Well, no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> I told you, you look young. You don't look that young. That, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, but the organization's only eight years old. So yep. to go yeah. from zero to hundred million in eight years does not seem even. It's a phenomenon. It doesn't seem like that could happen. So start yeah. from how I'm. So yeah, your day job, just to say. <laughs> Eight years ago, you're working for the manager of Coldplay. You're the assistant yes. to the manager of Coldplay. Yes. So you're, what are you doing there? Are you do, managing concerts or what, what was your job there? Like, I mean, I was a personal assistant, so I was doing a bit of everything um, and supporting him and the Whatever. team. And, yeah. but what was so incredible was that I, I saw so many different aspects of, I guess, if you want to call it the business model, yeah, but yeah. I saw how branding was done. I saw how marketing was done. I saw how touring was done. I mm. saw how all of their charity work was done. I saw oh, how my they, goodness. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I had like, that was most, your training. Yeah, I had the most amazing group. education there and, and, and like, you know, it's, it's an, it's incredible what, what they've achieved and the I scale yeah. that they, that they work on, but they also always treat everyone with kindness. They give everyone all of their time. I, I, I learned both a lot about like different industries, but also about like a way of, the human, a way of the being. humanity of it. Yeah. 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 And so it really was the best. It was, it was better than any degree I could mm -hmm. have done in terms of yeah. the training for this. And it was yeah. very transferable skills. That's so amazing. I feel very lucky been, and grateful. And it's been such a, uh, the marketing and the branding has been a huge, and, and, just, and the way you've raised money, just the, the modernness of it, the, 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 the hipness of it, the accessibility of it. It feels like something you can relate to, even if you're not your age, if you're my age, I still, it's just like, 
as compared to something that's very staid and serious, it, this is more makes you want to have fun and makes you want to get involved. So it's, okay. it's really been a, a master stroke. So, okay. So what, so then you heard, so it was like 2015 and you heard about these, these, this and Calais, what was yeah. going on to migrants and immigrants and refugees just stuck in a very bad situation. Yeah. I was, um, I'd been living in Los Angeles and, um, oh. the, the, everyone had gone back to England in the summer. So I had also gone back and that was when it was coined the refugee crisis. Yeah. And so it was a million people arrived over a million people arrived in Europe seeking sanctuary um, and safety. And it was mainly a people lot from, of, oh, from sorry. sorry, that's what I was yeah. going to ask it, mostly from Syria. Yeah. 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 Mostly from Syria. So I think it's about 70% were from Syria. Okay. Um, but it was also people from, Afghanistan, from Iran, from um, Iraq, oh. from Eritrea, from Sudan, from the Congo, mm -hmm. um, Africa, yeah. often like up to 20 nationalities, 25 nationalities in yeah. um, in a camp at a time. And so it, it, it was just crazy. And the, the, the images that we were seeing on the news of families crammed into these small boats of people trekking across borders through the forest you know we hadn't seen images like that since since world war ii and right. it was just it just felt so heartbreaking and i was just and it was right that, there it was close, it was on the physically. doorstep yeah exactly yeah. and so i said to some uh, a couple of friends at lunch i feel like we should try and do something why don't we try and raise a thousand pounds why don't we put on some kind of like little night yeah. um and and then we could gather some tents and sleeping bags we got connected to someone who was volunteering in, in Calais. Um, and they told us like the list of items that was needed, which was like tents, medical kits, yeah. socks, boots, um, food, certain types of food. And just for, so people can think of the, like your London base in Calais is about, it's in France, but it's about three hour drive through the, uh, yeah, you, 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 channel. Yeah. If you go, yeah. From driving from London all the way there takes about three hours, but the actual okay. train journey between the two countries is less than an hour. Uh, oh, um, okay. Yeah. Oh. So if you if you do the Eurostar London to um, London to Calais, it's less than an hour. Which okay. Is, yeah. Just to, yeah. It's so, so it's close. right there. It's yeah. and it's the British border is in Calais. It's externalized to there. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. Okay. Um, and so, um, yeah, we we wanted to do something to help. We we set up these links. I think we were kind of one of the first social media charities, I guess, that was born on, born on mm. social media. Um, mm. and people really wanted to help, but there wasn't that there, there wasn't an obvious way to do it. And I think we, we were that we were actually going to be called, we can help you help for a minute. We can um, help you help. Yeah. yeah. And because That's people good. wanted to help and they didn't know where to yeah. put that energy, but yeah. to our surprise, we raised over 50,000 pounds in the first week. Oh, in a um, week, and just a with week. your friends and and it got word it got mouth. shared a lot, and we were very lucky to be connected to a lot of people that had you know social media followings and stuff. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. So it raised over fifty thousand pounds, and then I had got an Uber in my lunch break to a storage center and begged them to give us a room for free because I couldn't mm. store. If so many people on Facebook said, "Yeah, I've got ten. I've got sleeping bags." I didn't have anywhere to put it. So I went to the storage space, yeah. begged them for a room. They said yes. And um, then we thought, why don't we do an Amazon wish list um, of mm. the, the items? It was actually one of the co founder sisters who thought of it. Um, and yeah, so we thought that's idea. a great idea. Yeah. People can buy things and it will be new. Um, right. And right. so, yeah, amazing. And so, but to my surprise, again, I got a phone call from this storage center the next day saying um, Amazon had been in touch. You've got a huge truck coming with seven thousand items. Um, that almost like, made me cry for some. But I, like, did that just like overwhelm you? That just overwhelms me hearing about yeah. it. Seven thousand items. Yeah, I, I. Do you know it was? I would look back now sometimes, and it, it was, it, it, it was such a whirlwind that I, yeah. I can't. Yeah. It, it was overwhelming. It was like, oh, well, now we have to do. Now we have to get yeah. volunteers to help us put yeah. it all away. <laughs> so, um, and, I, and then I was like, it's oh, growing well, I'll call, itself. Yeah, I'm going to call Pizza Hut and ask them if they'll give free pizzas for the volunteers. I mean, it was very, yeah, um, yeah it was organic. very organic. <laughs> yeah. Um, but before we knew it, there were forty people. Um, 
showing up every day to volunteer because the, the 7,000 packages arrived every day for weeks and weeks and weeks. Um, and so there were people from all ages, kids who just done their exams, who were 16. Oh my goodness. So did you just quit working for a while? Were you, oh, you were on break I was, anyway. I was moonlighting a bit, to be honest. Uh -huh. okay. I probably wasn't doing a very good job at my job. Um, <laughs> and, um, and yeah, and it was, it was totally crazy. And a lot of the other kind of core members of the, the team still now arrived at that time to come and volunteer in the, in the storage Oh, they're center. volunteers. Okay. Yeah. Wow. And so we then had all of this stuff. We had all of this funding mm -hmm. and what is still true now, um, in the same way that being on the ground and really knowing what's happening is really important to us, really doing right by people who've given us their money, their time, their energy, mm. their love, um, mm -hmm. was also really important. And so we, we decided we would go to Calais and we would see who was the best person to give this all to? And I truly believed that we would find a save the ch children. I probably shouldn't, you know, name, Another name the names a of big it, but a big, a big yeah. NGO yeah. Um, at, or a government there. And there was not, there was 5,000 people and they were living in a field. It was like mud up to your knees. People didn't have um, mm. shoes on. People didn't have enough food. People didn't have enough access to water. Um, I, on the news, there's just been all of these images of lots of young men who still absolutely deserve uh, our support. But there was families, children, the elderly. Oh, they weren't showing the. So even the news wasn't showing the full picture. No, they it was made because I saw. I've seen a lot of pictures of that time too, and you're right. It just looks like because they were calling it like a jungle, and it's just like you know, dog eat dog, and all these young guys running around and you know being dangerous in one yeah. way. Yeah. No, I never, you know, hear about families or kids or anything. No. And, and so it, it, it was shocking. I met unaccompanied children that day. I, I didn't even know that there was such Nothing. a thing as unaccompanied children. I always find it, um, you know, in the set, I now work very much in the sector and it's always like you, U A M or U A C. And it's like, mm. it's so de what we're yeah. actually talking about is yeah. children. Stripping the humanity out of it yeah. completely. The re yeah, the truth of it out, really. The truth yeah. of it. I, mean, yeah. I, I met an eight year old who was alone there on this journey. And I, and I, I always say, couldn't unsee what we'd seen and yeah. it was never so the there same were, again. There were, no, there were no structures in place. Were there, were there some or there no. were none? There Literally was zero. None literally none there were so, some local french actors like french organizations who were trying to distribute who were trying to build shelters one in particular who um we worked with for a number of years called la Berge de migrant who were uh made up of mainly uh, retired teachers um who, who mm. were who were doing the job that that a, a state should be doing so france had nothing to no involvement whatsoever the country of france the government of france no, they, they, there was like the riot police were there mm. in their riot police outfits, tear gassing the people, tear wow. gassing the family field at night. Wow. There, there ended up being some state, some state support, but like not to the degree that was, that was needed at all. And, and the state just continued to make the, the humanitarian work more and more, more difficult. But, but we, we ended up renting a warehouse at that time. We started a distribution system, a shelter building program. We started to work to support the, the unaccompanied children by funding social workers and ad, doing a lot of oh, advocacy. Yes. And at the same time, we were getting plugged into the grassroots response in Greece, where 10,000 people were arriving every day. All of this also coincided at that that Amazon wish list coincided with the photo of the little boy Island Kurdi who washed up on the shore, um, which is just you know the it's, such, it's just a heartbreaking image, but it, it changed the world. I I really think it did. I think it changed the world also. I just had someone on this on this program a couple of weeks ago who started uh, medic. What's it called? Mobile Medics International. From oh. C she was retired. She saw that picture. Yeah. And started this whole organization. And yeah, I mean, I, I, I feel like I already knew kind of what was going on, but it, I still, I can't, that image is just never, ever leaves you. No. It and, really, and it, really it showed doesn't. us like, oh, so this is, these are people, these are little children. These are. I know with these little shoes on, I know it, oh, it, it was, it, it's hot. It's truly heartbreaking. And I, I, yeah. I think that the, the outpouring of support that we had was b because of that photo. Um, mm. So we probably wouldn't be be here today mm -hmm. in, in the the yeah. in the in this place, but I, you know, just such such a tragedy. And 
um so we were we were one of one of someone i was working with at the time um flew out to greece because i couldn't because i had work um but why i mean why were you why were you looking over at greece and why were you we were just we were getting plugged into the volunteer networks on facebook and right and so we were like, we, we need to be helping there. It sounds like desperate and actually the scale and the numbers are higher. Oh, so you already could see that you wanted. So that was my question. Like, how did you, you know, pivot, I guess, from France into Greece? Because were, at were the you same, finished there at this happened at the same time? Same time. It was in the so same. You're like, well, we can same. help them. So did yeah. you now have this feeling that, oh, this is actually something people can just do? Like, I think it's really important yeah. for people watching this show to, to hear this story because you know, a, a lot of what I want pe people to understand is that it's things look so unreachable. Oh, you raised a hundred million dollars. I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to mm. run an organization, but oh, I could gather some things and, you know, go. So to see 100%. how you built it slowly. Yeah. Really I mean, helps. We, we never intended to be an organization. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I certainly never, ever thought that, you know, 10, 10, 10 years ago, I was a barmaid. <laughs> So, I know. Oh, <laughs> me. Yeah. And then you, so you worked there and then you worked a couple of years with Coldplay. Yeah. So I see. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I worked but you in have... telly a bit as well, but I, I, I think that that is the thing. Like if you aim, it's really important to have like the big vision and dream, although we didn't have that to start with, but I think setting, setting smaller goals, um, that are achievable that if, if, if I was sure. to be starting over at that, that's definitely what my advice would be. But for us, this was just like, this is a, a literal humanitarian crisis, yeah. but the likes of which we've never now. seen in our lives. Mm -hmm. um, and we have to act now and do, do mm -hmm. our part. We and, have the ability. And, and we just, and we were building up this social media following and people were mm -hmm. donating. And then we were, so in Greece, unlike France, the kind of Greek civil society is very strong. And mm -hmm. so there, there was a lot of response, but it was not by states or NGOs. Again, it was by Greek civil society and some international actors, small grassroots mm. organizations. So we didn't need to set up our own thing, but they needed funding, they needed awareness, they needed volunteers, they needed aid. Mm. And so the model of raising money and then grant giving to these organizations be began. And again, because we didn't have any experience in the sector, it was just asking, the community themselves and then these organizations what do you need and we didn't know that that was rad a radical way of doing things was to ask what people need and then raise oh. the money and give it to them it <laughs> oh, turns out that. that was that was actually quite radical oh that's so amazing it just seems like the most obvious thing right but it had developed in a whole other way so people didn't even think that way yeah I mean, the, whole, it, the whole organ the whole NGO had developed that we're going to figure out what you need and give it to you. And since you didn't know that system, you just went and did what was logical, which turns out to be the much better way. Yeah. Did, yeah. Did anyone stop you on the ground ever, whether it was in France or in Greece and say, Hey, who are you? What are, what are you doing here? Oh my yeah. gosh. Yes. Um, definitely. <laughs> and I mean, in so many different ways, you know, you, there was hostility from, from governments, from mm. councils, from the police, um why from, hostility why because people you... didn't want they didn't want these people to be here be there oh they so don't. they'd rather they didn't have the help yeah oh. um and there's been a very scary trend of like criminalization of humanitarian workers over the over the last few years um but then also yes. i think some of the um you know the volunteers or the aid workers because lots of lots of these organizations were often set up by people who'd worked in the in the set in the more formal sector and mm -hmm. then felt heartbroken that the, the formal sector wasn't responding so they were lots of uh, experts as well who were who were working with a bit like who are these uh, um who upstarts. are these girls who are these girls and i would be like turning off in my i'm so embarrassed now but i had like a little fluffy jacket and like bunches buns like who who is this girl <laughs> um, you weren't really blending in <laughs> no um um and but but how the proof is in proof is in the pudding and the work speaks right, for itself right, and so right. when when people you say what do you need and people say we need this and then you're able to deliver that hopefully we were we were able to build trust but it's you know it's mm -hmm. it's um Sometime. it's 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 been it's you know these contexts are all very complicated and 
we've 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 learned a lot we've made mistakes it's it's it's, it's been a journey it's um yeah yeah it's it's been a lot to a lot to work out but the, we just grew so quickly because we kept being told oh actually hmm. you know you're on one greek island we were flying out doctors we were funding field hospitals funding lights oh that goodness. shone out to the sea so the boats didn't crash on the rocks yeah then they're like, oh, actually, this this island also needs help. Or then, actually, this country in the Balkans, they need help. The, and the, then, there's no end. There's no, no end. No, and That's people in Turkey when... need help. People in Syria need help. And so we kept thinking, well, okay, we'll try. We'll try our best. And it just kept. It just grew so fast mm -hmm. because the need. How was many so of big. you were there at the, at the beginning? Like... At the beginning, the core team was about six of us. Okay. Um, and and did you start eventually start hiring people? When did you decide, okay, I'm going to quit my, I have to quit because I'm going to work for a month. <laughs> I became full time. So we started in the August, um, mm. August of 2015. And I became full time in the January of 2016. Though, to be honest, I yeah. was working full time yeah. before, before, before that. They're probably not listening. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we want um, our money back. <laughs> um, and, um, and but we weren't paying ourselves for mm -hmm. a, a good year, mm. I think. And then um, there, there was a, still even like two years later, it was only three or four of us who were working full full time. But we were pay, we were paying um, stipends for volunteers. So we had like uh -huh. two could have two hundred volunteers a day. We had field managers, and because of the model of us raising funds and grant giving it to organizations. We transitioned out of being operational ourselves um, yeah. because we felt that Pretty wasn't quickly. the most effective thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we sat under, we still do actually, a kind of fiscal sponsor in the UK. Oh, really? Um, and so we, we, we paid them a fee um, and they managed all of the finances. So we had a team who did oh, all of the finances and the legal lovely. and the compliance. Yeah. So you really could just focus on exactly what you needed to do. You're so streamlined. Exactly. And, but you still are under fiscal sponsor? Yeah, we some... are. We, we have a 501c3 in the US. Um, right. But in in the UK, obviously, we're in a position now where we could we yeah. could be on our be on our yeah. own and yeah. and build that that finance and compliance team. Mm -hmm. But you know, it adds a double layer of due diligence. We work in really complex contexts. The, I see. The, it's interesting. Uh, yeah, yeah it, it's, it's worth it for you then. Yeah, I sleep well that. at night yeah. knowing that yeah. everything is double checked. That yes. that actually the funding is we don't. I've never ever had access to the bank account to be able to send money. It has to. They have oh, to do everything. Well, it gets approved people. by multiple people. It's it. I I, huh. I just we're working with them. They're called Prison the Gift Fund. It's been the, the best thing that we've ever done. That's, that's, that's really smart. I, I haven't heard about people doing it for that reason. I mean, yeah, of course it's beginning, but to continue it because that level of trust for other people giving you money is so high as well. So that, yeah. that, I guess that's probably more uh, standard than I, I, I've run an NGO, but not for a while. And, and I always try to do my own and I did not sleep well at night. So yeah, <laughs> I mean, I still, I still don't sleep, really sleep that well, but, but one, one, for different one reasons. set of worries, yeah. One set yeah. of worries is, is, um, yeah. taken care of by being with prison. You know, I was wondering when you're talking about, and I heard you on another podcast or interview saying that, you know, it was sort of a wake up call to find out that, that sometimes that like you thought, like I would think too, like most people would think that if there were people in trouble, uh, that if they, if others just knew about it, that there would be help coming to them. Like, right. Why, why wouldn't they, you know? Yeah. Like, I, I genuinely, it, oh, sorry, no, you well, I was. It must have been like, has like a heartbreaking bit of a trip that you've been on to see kind of the darker side of humanity that mm -hmm. they are blocking. I mean, literally, I mean, before maybe they were ignoring um, that they're refugees, but I, I know, I, I, I'll just tell you really quick. I worked a little bit, I wrote a chapter about, I wrote a book about people who changed the world called One Person Acted and Everything Changed. And one of the people I interviewed in it was Christopher Catrabine, who started Moaz, which is- Oh, the, yes, my... amazing. We work with Moaz. Oh, you do? Oh, my mm. goodness. You know, and that was the thing. He's like, well, there's people drowning trying to get from Africa to, to Europe. They're just drowning in the water. So, you know, forget the politics. I'll, what, let's pull them out and then worry about it, right? Like, let's save them first, and then we'll talk about politics or where they should live. But- there's a lot of people not wanting that to happen. They'd rather have them drown. 
I know. And, and it's just like, how do you accept that? Uh, it, it can't. You can't. No. Uh, I how know. do you? It, it should be on the front page of every paper, you know? I know. I, 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 I just feel exactly the same. And I still can't really get my my yeah. head around that's it. good I, I hope you never do i i <laughs> yeah it 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 it's it's so mind-boggling and yeah I, when i as i said on that first trip i did to northern france and i met unaccompanied children i was like oh i was yeah. so hot i remember i just cried so much which and, and then i learned like you shouldn't cry in front of people um so I've, like le- you know learn learn to control that but i I I just thought, well, they must not know, and yeah. they must not know that they're there. And if we tell people, if we tell the people right. in power that that they there are mm-hmm. there are kids on their own there, then they'll they'll do something about it. And then over time, you know, we we went and knocked on every single. We knocked on all of these doors, yeah. and I was um, I look back now, I was like, God, I was so fearless. Um, literally going like into Parliament demanding to speak to really MPs. yeah going into really? offices of big ngos and well you're still pretty fearless <laughs> <laughs> you do um, now you just understand what you're up at you know the yeah. truth of what you're doing but you're still and, fearless and it was a it was heartbreaking to see wow this is people do know this is it, it, it this is intentional like a lot of it isn't is intentional and they yeah that, that's it, so that's, hard too by, it's really by, by hard. supposedly good people right the people yeah yeah. yeah and ju- you know just with the earthquake you mentioned this earlier but mm-hmm. the, the the white helmets who um i don't know if you know you know who i imagine I, you do you know since, yeah <laughs> well just since the war started they have been so instrumental in helping but go ahead explain who yeah. they are and, and they're they're incredible they are the organization who started when when the regime and then later russia was bombing its own people this is in syria Jennifer. in syria yeah. um they were they rescued the people from the from the rubble they've saved over a hundred thousand lives and a hundred thousand a hundred thousand lives and you know risk that they, they've lost 10 percent of their of their staff um over the over the years to just show the like I, the heroism of these people just i just want to make it a, a little bit more clear for anyone listening yeah. who doesn't really understand the situation so i mean not to explain the war in syria but the government is bombing its own people, right? Yeah. I mean, this is this is the situation in the country. And people asked for democracy in 2011, and yeah. th- that's what they were met with. Yeah. And so, I mean, everyone's familiar that they use chemicals on their own people and, and the whole bit. So these white helmets, I don't know where they emerged from, but they formed just like, you know, like this, the good guys. And they just started rescuing their own people that weren't being rescued yeah. by the government that were being killed by the government yeah. so they're still t- I, I, I don't hear much about them anymore so they're still together they're, they're still helping they're still there and the bombs are still dropping and people don't people don't know about it but they their work has developed there's an this area it's like the non-regime area that's 4.5 million people living there in the north and children in northwest yeah mm. and they are like the emergency services they do the fire rescue they're any to any oh. emergency they're called they mm. they fix the roads the bridges the water systems they do education they do support wow. for medical they're the ambulance i mean they 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 kind of do everything that a state would do they're the most incredible incredible people that have the great privilege of working with but when the earthquake struck they um they put a call out immediately for help from the un um because they they were the only people that had the 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 equipment to be able to carry out search and rescue but they didn't have everything that they needed so they were in syria and they called out to the un and said we mm -hmm. need help okay yeah and instead (laughs) of helping the the un went round and round in circles whilst people were losing their lives under the rubble because russia sits on the security council of the un about whether they could send help across the border or not and and by the time that they they did do anything to help it was too late and they've had to apologize they've apologized now but it's like it's such empty words and you just you just like i can't i just can't something I'm really proud of is that we were one of, if not the first people to reach out to them to offer funding. To the white helmets. Yeah. But how tragic is that? 
Like, well, it's it's <laughs> deeply, deeply upsetting to hear that about the UN. I, I know I read that you wanted to be when you were a kid that you wanted to work at the UN, and I did. Quite thinking, geez, I'm. I don't need to. Like, I'm doing better than the UN is. Like, I'm actually being more responsive than the UN. Um, um, yeah, yeah it, but that's it's, very. It's, I mean, I, I don't. That that's just like a. That's a whole other conversation because that so does not belong in an an emergency situation. That that they're even considering anything in that to no. do with Russia. What Russia thinks should happen in Syria is. Mm. It's just. It's sickening, honestly, because I bet really a is. lot of people died. Because of that decision. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And that and that that is the like real time consequences. I'm also like, I think I was very naive when I, I started this work. Yeah. And I, I'm I'm not so naive now. Like I I, yeah. I understand it's com like I understand that all of this stuff it is, is so complicated. Everything has a repercussion somewhere else, right? Yeah. So if they do that there, then in then in Ukraine something else is gonna happen. And yeah. I know. I know it's not simple. But it's like pulling the people out of the water. Just can you save their lives and then argue about it? Exactly, later? exactly, exactly. And and that and is, UN should know better. They should, yeah, they, they should. They do or, know better, or at least speak speak out and say this is this yeah. is this is this is not okay, or the system isn't working, or or whatever. But no, it, that the to go back to the original question, I went right off on the tangent. But it, the education with is, you, <laughs> <laughs> the the education of wow the the the, the system mm -hmm. and it, it really is built against these these people and the, you know displaced people are often the most vulnerable communities on earth and that people vilify them and use mm. their their situation for political gain is like it's really well sad. and you alluded earlier to the color of your skin i mean i just have seen because i i've worked in the middle east a lot and I I could just tell from my sheltered little world in the U.S. that uh, when the Ukraine refugee crisis started, I mean, everyone I know had Ukraine. And I, I also supported Ukraine. I mean, no one was not supporting the refugees. But the difference in the response to Ukrainian refugees versus the uh, 700 million, however, I don't know how many there are right now. I mean, that, that are million. black. They're black and brown and Muslim and, you know, Mexican and whatever, but they're not, they don't look like white Europeans or white, you know, West Westerners. So it's just, it's, it's the core of what society is, but it's hard. It's hard it to is. see that in real time and, and to know, but it makes me think, makes me understand more the importance of like people like you, the people that are actually out there doing the work that don't take that stance, you know, that fight for the, you. Cause when you, when it's really clear what the problem is, it don't you think it galvanizes you more to say, okay, well this is happening. So now we have to work 10 times harder to get through. Cause now we know what we're up against. Yeah, for sure. I definitely think so. I think the, 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 the drive of the organization and of, of me is, is exactly built on that. Like we, we know what we're up against it, And so mm -hmm. we've, we've got to fight fight for what we believe in. But it, with Ukraine, it, it was, uh, I, I'm the same, I always feel torn because obviously it was, it's horrific what right. happened. And, and the numbers and the, are and, horrific. And the numbers are horrific and the, yeah. no one person has more value than any other person. So for, for the situation for, for the displaced Ukrainians, they absolutely deserve all, all of the support and more, like to be honest, that the, the, the the world has moved has moved away the organizations we work with now they're, they're still facing the same thing and that there isn't the funding for them like more help is still needed for ukraine but mm. the disparity between the the response for ukraine and the yeah. response for other places you know in russia was bombing in syria and for, for all right. of that all of this time is, no is. One was, is yeah. and no one was doing anything and then when they started doing it in ukraine everyone did some, uh, the, you know the, the level of outpouring yeah. of support was so huge and i don't think people have joined lots of people haven't joined the dots to see like this is this yeah is, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's the, the same, same thing. country yeah. yeah yeah so what the, the tactics that they used in syria were then used in in ukraine it was you know they were they were testing things out and do you think so i think so or at least like lesson whether it that whether it was 
testing it out for what was in the future they just but they're the learning from what they're it. doing yeah. exactly yeah i think that's probably a better way to say it and um I don't know. but yeah and then even within ukraine you know something that we we've seen time and again in the different places we worked is that the the there's a disparity in response for for people from different places and then there's the most marginalized are usually always left left out and so when yeah, with so, ukraine um... we 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 prioritized um finding organizations both who were working right on the front line but also those that were supporting marginalized communities mm. and um i'm sure you probably remember seeing in the news there was this you know horrible um instance that uh people of color and black people from uh, different universities in within oh, Ukraine were trying to cross the border fleeing and then they weren't being allowed to cross into Poland it was yeah. so so appalling and disgusting yeah. and yeah. um so we were able to that. work with an amazing organization called uh, Foundation for Somalia started by an amazing man from mm. Somalia called Elmi who who lives in Poland um oh, really? and and he he and his team were like there helping those people oh. advocating for them at the border um, but, you know, it was really important to us that we were finding those organizations and getting resources to them. Um, and the same for yeah. the organizations helping the elderly or people with disabilities oh. who, who so often get left out of the response. Wow. How, how do you find these organizations on the ground? That's one of the questions I had. Like, you just literally have to go there and start looking so, when so, something happens. <laughs> so much of her work has come um, from that. But obviously, we have a very strong we have a network now of now, the kind of yeah. grassroots responders of human rights activists, mm -hmm. um, journalists, people who work in the formal sector in the, in the NGOs. Mm -hmm. And I, and just to say, they're not like, some of them no, are incredible. Like MSF, for example, oh, are, yeah. are like my favorite. Yeah. I don't know. I wouldn't yeah. really put them in the same group, but yeah. you know that we, we work a lot with people from, from MSF yeah. and, yeah. Um, and <clears throat> for Americans, that's doctors without borders. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everything's a little different. Yeah, but it is. Um, yeah. And so uh, with Ukraine, we didn't work in, inside Ukraine. Um, we worked on the Poland Belarusian border. We had a couple mm -hmm. of organizations there, so we had some network. We flew a team of two out to um, Poland on, I think, on the day of the, the invasion, um, and then we just really started putting our putting our feelers, feelers yeah. out, and we were just asking advice from other organizations: who should we mm. be supporting? Who's supporting marginalized communities? Uh. Um, and just really, really putting the effort in really yeah. to do our homework and find out yeah. who was working, who was responding. Journalists who huh. were inside were telling us like, I'm here at this school and there's 800 people living here. And this is the, the organization who's giving everyone food. So then we mm. would get connected to them. And then you have a, how are we going to get the money to them? That's then there's always the, that's the also next always hard. And the next always step. Always figuring stuff out. Yeah. yeah. But it's, it, it, you just have to work. put the effort in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, you, yeah. It, it, it's just a lot of like what, putting puzzle pieces together, yeah, I think, yeah, and, and taking yeah. the time and, you and get, resource to do that. And you get better at it. The, the more you do it, the more you figure out how to do it, right? Yeah, and you exactly. Must, yeah, because it starts to look, some things probably start to look the same in terms of where you start, you know, like whereas in the first time you show up, you don't know anything, but now you're like, oh, I need to get this, this, and this set up. Yeah. Exactly. And we, you know, there's things that we know now. We know yeah. that it will be the grassroots who will be, yeah. do, who will be responding. We know yeah. that there's going to be a need for food. We know there's going right. to be a need for temporary shelter. We know yeah. that there's a need for Coats. women's support. We know mm -hmm. women who are traumatized might not be able to breastfeed. And so you need to make oh, sure wow. that there are organizations who will support those um, women. You know, there's the you all of these about. lessons that we now yeah. know. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I want to pivot, uh, well, I want to leave plenty of time to talk about, um, fundraising because this, obviously this is something you figured out how to do and really, um, really well. I mean, I don't, I don't, it, it's just kind of mind blowing the amount of money that you've been able to raise and distribute. Um, I, well, and, and we, there's so many different ways we can talk about it, but Let's first, let's talk about the stores because everyone loves to talk about the stores. I want to go to with stores. You have these pop-up stores. But, <laughs> yeah. Um, um, so, so in 2000 and 
16 in the winter mm. we were now like you know i want to say fairly established we we're only a year and a half old but we were <laughs> we were fairly established yeah. and we were working across countries continents and supporting people wow. through through winter and um we were the really really lucky to be the guardian newspaper charity partner oh and, really yeah oh my goodness and again the, a lot of the guardian journalists work really closely with us um because we were on on the ground and so we were able to give them the information and the yeah. access that they needed Which... to write their story so they those journalists advocated internally huh. at the guardian to make huh. us uh, the charity partner but we raised nearly a million pounds through that partnership and um we were the, the following year we were just like what are we going to do because we can't be the guardian charity partner again oh. um and it's going to be winter we were now even bigger um mm -hmm. and still working completely i mean we, you know we're not it's not not to the same degree now but at that time like uh, it would often be a week before the end of the month and i'd be like oh my god what how are we gonna how are we gonna pay how are we gonna pay for all the invoices next week and somehow something magical would always happen yeah um, have some help coming too yeah <laughs> and um places <laughs> yeah and um but in the, it, it, ahead of this winter we were really like what are we gonna do and people had kind of got a bit bored of of, of talking about the refugee crisis and the tension was yeah. waning and there was a bit of donor fatigue i would say and someone that we worked with on syria um had just been on his honeymoon and he was a creative and comms expert and he uh and what thinking, expert a co co like communications expert oh uh-huh comms yeah. and he had been thinking about our amazon wish list um and he uh, on his honeymoon had had this idea what if they did the amazon wish list as a store um and he came into the office this guy on his honeymoon trying to yeah. all this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and he came anyway. into the office and i had he said i've had this idea can i have a meeting so we had a meeting he's called james he runs a, a, a creative agency called glimpse now um in which he was just setting up at the time and uh, he said, what if you did a physical store, the Choose Love store, you opened on Black Friday to turn consumerism on its head. And on Black Friday? Yeah, uh -huh. on Black Friday. Um, and uh, people could be like the Amazon wish list. People could buy the items and they would get sent to, sent to refugees. And I just thought it was the most amazing idea. Shared it with the team. We all thought it was brilliant. And then we worked on developing it together. And we'd now learned that you know, buying aid in a country and then shipping it to other countries is is not economic. It's not environmentally friendly. Right. You need to be supporting no local sense. economies. So we were like, right, people can buy the items and then we'll use those funds to grant give to our partners in the country so they can buy the items yeah. locally. Um, so the, the model kind of developed from there. And then we were like, well, we may as well keep it open until um, Christmas and the, for the holidays because so it was people can buy story. presents. It was a pop up store. Yeah, yeah it's, it, it still okay. is. It pops up every year. So so okay. I, I asked a friend, do you know where we can get a, a someone can give us a free a free store space in Soho in London? Got connected to someone. They gave us mm -hmm. a store for free. Oh, really? Free? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Um, and before I think we turned it around in six weeks, we opened mm -hmm. this store, the Choose Love store. We wanted it to look cool. We wanted to turn charity shops on their head a bit too and not make it like stuffy, not make it something that was just for one bit of society, but something for everyone that was like a cool place to be. So we we made it look like the Apple store. We had a long table down the middle, like the Apple store with all of the items on. We oh, had a, a big brilliant. Instagram moment, a choose love sign that we made oh. out of um, the gold uh, bl like blankets that keep people warm. From, so from yeah, shop. explain the items a little bit because I think maybe we didn't get that uh, clarity of what you were selling in the shop. Like so, that's what makes it so. Yeah, so it was amazing. built. It was built. Um, it was built around what we needed to be distributing and what we needed to right. be funding that winter. So the idea on the table, we split it into three sections, arrival, shelter, and the future. And in the arrival section, it was the things people need in the emergency. So that emergency foil blanket, um, hot food. So that's um, sitting on the table, like so they, they can the walk table. up and buy a blanket. Yeah, yeah. a child's yeah. coat, yeah. child's very, warm, very uh, visceral, boots, right? very visceral. You, you, People yeah. literally burst into tears when they. Oh, I when know they it's hard to even actually items. talk about. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why. It's just like because it, it makes it real. It's not you're not writing a check. You're like seeing a kid's coat. Yeah, right? and then it's and like you, okay, yeah, I can spend thirty. Whatever. Yeah, uh, and you're connected that there's a kid somewhere who doesn't yeah. have a coat. Yeah, it makes and, it so real. Yeah, yeah. and then so we, you just collect the money. You're not really, you know, and that just, it's just a means to 
Yeah, many, uh, but but yeah. but it really does do that thing at the other end. Oh, it so really does buy a coat. It really exactly. buys a coat. Oh, I see. Wow. Yeah, it does. Okay. We, the, just the mechanism that we do that yeah. by is by granting it to an organization who's yeah. buying coats and then they buy the coats locally. But we also needed to support services. So we had a life jacket on the, on the table, uh -huh. but you weren't buying a life jacket that the buying the life jacket was supporting search and rescue organizations in, ah, the, in the sea. So it was going I towards see. their running yeah, costs. Yeah, so yeah. There, there were both uh. versions. So then in the shelter section, we had like a tent. Um, we had a hygiene pack because we a lot of our partners buy great. a lot of like have wow. to buy shower gel and sanitary yeah, items and yeah. and all of those things and then we That's had the section so the future um, because we don't believe anyone should be living in a refugee camp and we believe mm. that everyone should be in their final destination with their rights um, and be able right. to work go right. to school right. reach they their should potential be in a home somewhere yeah yes. so my yeah. one of my favorite items was we had a, a a set of keys and a welcome like mat. oh my god you're killing me <laughs> <laughs> you really are <laughs> um yeah that's, and that, that is just so that so that was very successful obviously yeah it yeah. was hugely successful we made an yeah. online version as well you could do yeah. gift cards so you can buy it on behalf of someone else and we did it it's like dear mom you won't find a present under the tree this year instead i've bought you yeah. a tent for some for a refugee that really needs it and someone can go online right now to love dot I yeah choose dot love Cho choose love dot yeah. say choose, it again choose dot love like it's, oh choose it's, dot love it's oh, dot, oh, dot love instead it. of dot com yeah, yeah. oh for the my store. goodness oh for the store okay the store because is choose dot love and we're our organization website is choose love dot org oh that's what i thought okay okay well yeah. that's uh fantastic and i i will definitely obviously put all those um things in the and oh, thank you. All the links on the show notes. But I wanted to say, so I don't know if you know this, but I raised some money for Choose Love a couple of years ago. And I thank did it you. by raising, um, climbing. I wanted to climb 14K, 14,000 foot. Yeah, you're, yeah, honestly, you're so amazing. Well, <laughs> it's amazing that I could make it. But, um, but I want to tell people about it because you make it so easy to have an event. So if you go to your website, now you can like say fundraise. So if somebody wants, I just think that's such a great way to raise funds. I was able to raise $5,000. I could never have given $5,000, but it took like three weeks oh. and it just was like that. You know, you get enough people on social media and 5,000 is not that hard. And, but that, and that, that is why we've been able to raise a hundred million. Like right. truly it's because of people like you, honestly, it's, well, it's, it's a movement rather than a it, charity. It, yes, I really and, think that it is. I think you are so right that you're starting a move or you have started a movement, but I just want to encourage people who are listening to check that out because it's, it's fun. Like you can have your own fundraising page, like in, in five minutes. Yeah, you, know? you can. And, and even if it's on... not 5,000, you know, that's like oh, no. an amazing 500. amount, but 550, yeah. whatever it is, I know. it yeah. helps like a, yeah. a meal, a meal for someone is like 50 cents. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and for your birthday or whatever, you know, a lot of people do, Fundraisers, birthday, yeah, they do yeah, birthday fundraisers. Like and I yeah. always see people like they do they do running races or something, and I think you could also do something like a, a readathon. You know, it doesn't have to be a physically active thing or a uh, sewathon or a, exactly. You know. I always like seeing the bake. Lots of people do bake sales, and then they write "cheese love" on the cakes. Oh, I like that. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Everyone loves a bake sale. <laughs> everyone loves a bake sale. Yeah. Someone did a bake sale for the uh, earthquake. It was a group of chefs actually. Um, in mm. London, and they raised literally tens of thousands. Oh. It was crazy. The thing is, it, it creates community. And I think that's something that people really crave right now anyway, especially yeah, for me after COVID shut down. I just like, ah, oh, let me just be in the community more because, you know, people kind of got so isolated. And I just think it's a great way for people to just get five friends together to do something, you know, so. Yeah, me um, too. Or, or whatever they do but <laughs> yeah me too and it really it's it's magical and that there's human beings on the other end of that who are then able to fund schools who are then able to um make sure their children get the medical services that they need because because people take the time and effort to to set up yeah. a fundraising page do the event climb the mountain and that's yeah. amazing well what would you um what i'm just thinking what is just going forward what do you see like this humanitarian landscape looking like how's it changing and you know because you know i know there's going to be a lot more um environmental i guess we'll call them or climate 
refugees, which you're probably already seeing more of, I'm guessing, or have you? Have you actually come across that yet? Yeah, absolutely. You, the, that the, you had to help with? Yeah, the, 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 the kind of stat, and I always feel a bit conflicted about talking about this because it can be used also by people who are anti-migration, but the there's some reports that say it will be a billion people displaced by 2050 because of the climate. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And so for me, that is a signal, wow, we have to start thinking about solutions. We have to do something about right. it. But unfortunately right. for some people, it's a signal we have to build walls. We have to think about well, putting wave machines in the sea to stop people from oh, coming. I mean, just oh, so crazy. Stop. Wave I machines? That, that's a real thing oh. that the UK thought about doing. I mean, it's just- Oh, not. I can't even go there. So- no. uh, So um, it's, it's, it's basically, it's gonna be, uh, 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 a few years, decades, where the need for supporting community-based organizations who are supporting these communities is only going up. Um, right. And to be also really thinking about what advocacy we can be doing to, to get people mm -hmm. to think about solutions rather than building walls. And is that something that you, you are working on or you're talking about a lot? Like how do yeah. we change? How do we grow to meet that need? Absolutely. And you won't know, you'll never know because every year it will change and, and, and get larger, right? Yeah, yeah, but, it, um, it is. It is. Well, we'd, go ahead. Do you want to say something? Oh, no, I was going to say, and the, the kind of responding to emergencies is another kind of big strand of our work. We've seen with the earthquake, with Ukraine, prior to that, Afghanistan, that we're mm. able to mobilize resources and get them when they're, where they're needed really quickly. So we kind of have these two strands of work that, that, that we're doing. Well, you're, you're doing incredibly wonderful, incredible work. And um, I, I guess the last thing I just wanted to ask you is like, if you, if you wanted to talk to someone yourself as a younger person or a youth that are thinking about going into humanitarian work or, or even political work, like, would you have any advice for them if they were just starting <laughs> out? Um, would you recommend think, it in general? <laughs> I, I, you have to love it, I think. But I think that's mm -hmm. true of anything. I think if you, if you love something and you believe in it, then it doesn't feel like work, even when it's right, really, really sure. hard. Yeah. Um, but I think believe in yourself, believe that you can do things differently. Um, don't take no for an answer. Don't be afraid to fail, I think, is the, one of the most um, you will, important again things. Because you, you will, and they'll be your greatest lessons. Yeah. Have you gotten a lot stronger? Do you feel like you've changed in, to another person yeah. almost entirely? Almost entirely, yeah. yeah. I, I feel like I never want to lose the, um, the 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 like core of what it was that that yeah, made this all happen in the first place. But yeah, I could I could never have imagined that I would be in this position and and know what I know now. And I I don't take that responsibility lightly. Well, you know what that tells me that in another eight or 10 years, you're not going to recognize this person. <laughs> You'll probably change that much again, you know? Yeah. Wow. Because yeah. That's the world is amazing. changing so much. It, it is. is. Well, you're amazing. <laughs> you're amazing. You're definitely my hero. I, I just <laughs> love what you're doing. I'm going to do everything I can to support you guys. Oh, because thank you I so just, much. I We're just, all in it uh, together. We are all in it together. And as soon as we get that through our heads, <laughs> the world will be fine, right? It will. Yeah. It will. Right. We have to believe that. We do. <laughs> well, thank you so much for Chelsea, having, thank having you me so and for much. all you've done for Cheese Love. Uh, I haven't done that much, but I'm just getting started. So <laughs> I'm picking my new venture right now. So we'll Yay! see what it is. <laughs> I'll let you know. I'll keep you thank posted you. and uh, safe travels with every, wherever you, you go. And um, we'll stay in touch. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.